thank you. You may be seated. And I'll draw your attention to the screen where our memory verse is found. And as usual, we'll begin with the reference, say the verse, and go back to the reference. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. John 1, 4. Before we go to God in prayer, just one update for your prayer list. Carol Hankst, as in Mrs. Herb Hankst, uh, fell this week, and she is at the Haven Drive campus of Pine Haven, where she is receiving physical therapy. So please add Carol to your prayer list. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for the life that we have in Jesus. And we give thanks that we can live each day without having to live with guilt and shame that come with sin uh, because of what you've done for us through Jesus' death and resurrection. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for your mercies that come new with each day, including this day. And thank you for the opportunity to come together as your people to celebrate all the things that you are doing in our lives. We praise you and we thank you for your faithfulness day in and day out. And Lord, forgive us when we doubt, when we doubt your mercy and grace, when we doubt your love and your presence in our lives. During those times, remind us that you are with us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Indeed, that you care deeply for us and help us feel your presence with us. And help us to push the pause button long enough to reflect on the things that you are doing in our lives, as well as in the lives of those around us. We pray for your blessing upon our consistory, our elders, our deacons, as each of those groups meet tomorrow night. Guide them through their agendas. Give them wisdom for any decisions that they need to make. And we pray for your blessing on our junior high students and their sponsors on their trip to Noah's Ark this week. Keep them safe in their travels and while they're at the park. Help them to be strengthened in their relationships with one another as well as their relationship with you. We pray for your healing mercies for Ann DePachter as she recovers from surgery. Give her wisdom to know how best to cooperate with you in the healing process. We lift you, Carol Hengst and Eunice Lensink, as they receive physical therapy. Carol at Pine Haven and Eunice in her home. We pray, Lord, that you would give each of them the strength that they need. We pray for your continued healing for Callie Raymaker. And God, we just give thanks for the progress that has been made in the healing process for Callie. We ask for patience for Deb and Stratton as she continues with tests and as she waits for you to reveal your plan for her surgery. Just give her the strength that she needs to face each day's challenges. And Lord, we pray for your peace for Carrie Creer and her family as they await test results. And we pray, God, for physical comfort for Carrie as she's been dealing with some pain. We ask for you to bring relief, and we ask for wisdom for those who care for her. We lift up to you Tom Horn and Chip Lumco and Paul Vervelli as each of them deal with various health issues. Give each of them what they stand in need of. And we pray for our partners in mission, Shar and Dave Alexander, as they spend their final two weeks of service in Taiwan um, before their retirement. We pray that you would give healing mercies to Shar uh, for her foot so that she's able to walk on and off the plane when they leave for the United States in the end of the month. We pray for Dave as he preaches his farewell sermon uh, this coming Sunday. And we pray for all the students who will be entering into Tainan Theological College, that you will use them to become faithful and effective leaders at the end of their studies. And we pray for Dave and Char just in the upcoming months as they travel and as they visit supporting churches. 
Help them to share the good news of Jesus and help them to testify to your faithfulness to them and through them in the work that they've been doing. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to each of us. Help us to bear witness to your faithfulness each day and help others to experience your love as they see Jesus living in us. Hear our prayer as we offer it to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite Cindy Hoyte to come up. She has an update for love in the name of Christ. Hi, Diane Josie and I are the CMCs or the Church Ministry Coordinators for Love in the Name of Christ. We just wanted to introduce anyone who isn't familiar with loving to their purpose, update, and make you aware of needs and opportunities. Loving's mission or purpose is to mobilize local Christian churches to transform lives and communities through relationships in the name of Christ. Our vision we are members of Christian churches united in purpose and living out our faith through loving service to the people in our communities, opening our hearts to give and receive love, truth, and compassion as we are joined together in Christ. This spirit of working together is evident in our communities through churches in partnership, and there are 39 in Sheboygan County right now, service organizations learning and succeeding and realizing their missions, and everyone making progress toward the fullness of life. Our core values, we are Christian. What we think, say, and do is in the name of Christ. Prayer is an integral part of who we are. We follow Christ's example of valuing all people. We respect unity in the body of Christ. We value transformation in the lives of people and in communities. We join and support churches in living out the two great commandments, to love God and to love our neighbors. We value building Christ-like relationships, recognizing these represent the fullness of life. We honor the connectedness of the loving movement. We model excellence in our operation, including our commitment to stewardship of all resources. And we continually mature in our capacity to recognize and meet the needs of all people, especially those requesting services and our volunteers. As a partner, uh, partner church, FRC Oosberg has accepted the role as co-gap leaders along with Zion Church in Sheboygan for the bedding and linen ministry. We have also been active in collecting products for other gap ministries, and last Thursday we began to participate in the transformational ministry by preparing and providing a meal for the Affirming Potential class, which is the first step in the transformational ministry. Last Sunday, Pastor Bob's message was encouragement. How crucial it is within our church family but also in our communities. That's Loving's role. They are the hub, and the 39 churches work together to fill the needs of our neighbors, being the hands and feet of Jesus, and providing love and encouragement. You may ask where you fit in. Through Love, Inc., there is a place for every person to give, serve, or be an encouragement. Through prayer, faithful prayer warriors are needed for every aspect of this ministry. Through giving, Filling an immediate need is always the first step. Our bedding ministry is always accepting donations, and anyone is welcome to join Terry Lemko, Diane, and myself in picking up delivering bedding as needed and just any other jobs that um, it requires. The Love Buckets ministry is collecting right now, and also Love, Inc. is moving to a new location, and there's a list of needs that need to be filled. You can support them through events. Come and support events that benefit Love, Inc. Brat prize, bake sales, bowling, mini golf, etc. Love, Inc.'s gap ministries fill needs not met in the community. FRC is so blessed to serve our community with a food vault and distribution. I was blessed to observe this ministry and it truly follows the mission of love in the name of Christ and meets more than needs by focusing on sharing God's love and connecting and walking with those they serve. You can also take the volunteer training if you'd like to work directly with our neighbors. Whatever talent or gift you have, Love, Inc. can plug you in. The biggest need we have right now is for people willing to walk with neighbors in the transformational ministry. It began in June with the first class, Affirming Potential, which is designed to help participants start a life-changing, lifelong journey to face and accept the past, better understand the present as they lean into and embrace the future. It explores the physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual areas of life, building on the foundation that God created us with intrinsic worth 
and unique potential. This class is for both community members and those who desire to mentor. We eat, learn, connect, and fellowship together. I want to end with a small message from the book Redemptive Compassion. We hope to offer this study soon to help us begin this journey of encouraging. While offering temporary relief is for legitimate immediate needs is important, we need to take the next step. Imagine someone has fallen and they cannot get up without help. I could give handouts in the form of food or a blanket and a pillow, and while they would receive immediate and temporary relief, it would not help them to their feet. If I wanted to extend a hand up, I would have to not only meet their immediate physical need, but come close enough so that I could extend my hand to them and share in their burden. As they grasped my extended hand and we pulled together, it would take our combined effort and struggle for lasting results to be achieved. A handout is often a temporary fix to an ongoing need, but a hand up can be a life changing for all involved, transforming all of our lives. If you have any questions um, about anywhere that you can fit in, please see us at um, the Love Inc. booth, which is now moved to the Coffee Connect just for a little while, um, and we'd be happy to help you plug into Love Inc. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. I got some kids here that were at Life Fest. So this is mostly for them. But I need everybody to stand up if you're able. Please stand up. Yeah, there we go. Get a little stretching, okay? Just to move some blood around. Yeah? There we go. If you got a loved one here, you want to get a little back rub? You do that, a little back rub over there. Get some things going. Yeah? Okay, now before you sit down, when you sit down, sit to the back of the seat, okay? Nice propped up, if that's uh, comfortable and ready to go, okay? When you sit down, back of the seat, so nice posture, good, posture's good. Ready? All right, now I have a seat. Ready? Whew. Here we go. Good morning. We're in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you would please turn there because uh, we're going to be continuing in our series through the book of Philippians. Uh, the series is called This is the Life. And instead of reading the whole passage through, I'm going to be taking it a few verses at a time. So we won't have the passage up on the screens for you, but uh, we're going to be reading out of the same version of the Bible that's in your pew. So the other book that's in front of you in your pews, you can get that out and it will have the same translation that we'll be reading from. I recommend you get that out. Again, we're in the book of Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be going through uh, 1 through 11. As you're doing that, after last week's passage, and as we continue in this week's passage, Paul is our author, and he has this larger-than-life persona as I read it. To the Philippians especially, he was this spiritual giant. And what, a, what an incredible way the Lord has decided to use this person through his missionary journeys writings to the various churches, in the lives of those he discipled, and through orchestrating the launch of the spread of the gospel throughout the whole world. You think about that kind of an impact and the confidence Paul had in going to do that. Have you ever had someone like that in your life? Who, if you think about it, who would be your spiritual giant? I want you to get that person in your head. Who would be that person whose faith you admire, who you uh, look up to, who maybe has played a similar role as Paul did for the early church? Think about who that might be. In seminary, one of my first classes was Bible study methods. And I walked in on the first day, and up front is this 80-year-old dude, Right? He had a patch on one eye. He was all bald on top, and he was hunched over the podium like this. And I was like, what did I get myself into here? I see why some people called it cemetery accidentally, then seminary. Because I was like, this guy. And the bell rang, and the prof looks up. And there's a fire in his eye and a spring in his step. 
And he taught that Bible study methods class every day like a 25-year-old. I was so engaged. That first day, I forgot to take notes. I couldn't believe this guy and how he was teaching. It was like a fire hose. And I was just like, are you kidding me? It was incredible. I'd like you to meet this person, get to know him a little bit better through a video I got here. Take us from your days as a student until you began to teach. Well, as long as I can remember, I have been teaching. Did you know as a student that you wanted to be a teacher? No, but I knew that that's where I was comfortable. Mm -hmm. So when I came here, which was 1950, that's the ending of World War II. And all the guys that came, they didn't know anything about the Bible. Yeah. So I taught them the books of the Bible. I used to meet up in third floor of Davidson. Yeah, you know, and teach them this type mm. of thing. Okay. Because yeah. I, I love this place. I mean, I'm not in it because I can't do something else. I'm in it because I'm totally convinced that we've got the answer here. Call me selfish. I love to teach. I live to teach. And the result is, you know, I knew that there was going to come a time when, sure, you know, realistically, you're going to say, you're coming to the end of the ball game here. But uh, what, what has encouraged me more is the large number of guys teaching elsewhere who were the product of what I built into the world. You know, and that's the only thing. I mean, I, I'm, I never was concerned about money. I, I have to say that honestly. Uh, that's peanuts to me. I'll do it for nothing if you won't pay me. Okay. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you see what I You don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> you need to save that for our conversation. <laughs> I just... I've loved the whole experience. That's a tough thing to leave, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, on behalf of... Uh, what now, alumni? 10,000, 11,000? 13,000 13, alumni. Every one of whom, for the most part, went right through your courses. Uh, it has to be gratifying to know that a bit of you has now impacted their lives, changed their lives, gone with them, with us. And on their behalf, thank you for 60 plus years of faithfully holding forth like no one else we've ever been around. It's been shared in my it's my Amen to that. That's for sure. It's been shared in my It's an incredible blessing to be considered one of those guys. Prof. Or Howard Hendricks was my Paul. My spiritual giant. I took about every class I could from him. And I'd only gotten to know him and learn from him at the end of his ministry. Dr. Hendricks went on to be with the Lord two years after I graduated. Taught for 60 years, as it said, reaching over 13,000 students. And this video has my favorite quote from him where it says this. I'm, in, I'm not in it because I can't do something else. I'm in it because I'm totally convinced that we've got the answer. That kind of confidence is what we're talking about today. It's inspiring to be around that kind of confidence. It's encouraging. It's engaging. How can we have that same confidence? I believe that is some of what Paul is addressing in our passage today. So let's dive in. We're just going to read verse 1 to start of Philippians chapter 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write 
the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. I'm really grateful for this first verse of this passage uh, because today, uh, as some of you might remember, as we get into this passage, you're going to recognize a lot of the verses because Pastor Bob uh, taught on this passage about two months ago. And so he had preached uh, the same scripture there, uh, but I'm glad the verse says it's no trouble to write you the same thing. So I'm hoping uh, not only it's okay to write the same things, but it's also to preach the same passages to you. So I just kind of pulled up Bob's transcript, and uh, from here on out, you know, that's what will... Think that work? Just don't tell him. Just don't... No, that's not... That's not what we're going to do. God's Word is living and active. Amen? Bob taught this passage. Uh, it was after Easter. After we were done with Easter, it was kind of our Easter reprise series. Uh, but now we have a greater context here as we've been going through the book of Philippians. Uh, Jerry Dystra a few weeks back taught on the importance of the unity of the body of Christ and being together, right? And then uh, two weeks ago, Bob taught about our working out our faith. And this last week, as Cindy mentioned, on the need for genuine, uh, how important genuine encouragement is in the faith. Uh, and this kind of a, a buildup, this kind of a buildup that's going, this momentum that's going, all of a sudden comes to a stop uh, at the beginning of chapter 3. Paul throws on the brakes, and he's got a warning for us that's coming up. Let's pick it up in verse 2. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. There's one primary warning here, before we kind of unpack uh, what that is, what do you think it might be? All right, let's just kind of put on some, some reasoning, uh, some reasonable thinking here. As you're united in the faith, right, let's say you're united with a group of believers, right, and uh, you can sense that togetherness and, and the excitement that comes with it, and then, and then you see the Lord doing amazing things among your group among who you're with, and the encouragement that that provides. And then you want to encourage more of it, right? And so you're encouraging each other uh, to continue on, to continue doing this. This creates this momentum, right? This kind of a building that's going, that's, that's chugging along. And we might be saying, oh, this is so fun. This is so fun to be doing this together. Look at all that's being done here. Way to go. Keep it up. We're doing it. Did you catch the temptation? Who's doing it? Is it us? Are we the ones responsible for all that's taking place? Paul warns the Philippians and us about this mentality, that in the midst of this momentum in the early church, even with the persecution that was taking place, in the midst of all that momentum, it can be really easy to think it's us. And it was particularly evident among one certain group of religious people. Paul referred to them as the dogs. And what this group of people were doing, they were confusing these new Christians about what it is that all this buzz is about. All of this momentum that's building up, that Paul is encouraging them to do, that creates this momentum. They weren't necessarily encouraging the same thing. They were putting their confidence in what they were doing. They were putting confidence in what they were doing. And Paul uses them as this example of what not to do here. They were called the Judaizers. Jews who, though they believed in Jesus, still insisted that you also need to live according to the Jewish customs. So the Judaizers would teach that in order for a Christian to truly be right with God, they must do certain things in the law, especially regarding the sign of the covenant, which was circumcision, and this would be necessary even for salvation. 1 Corinthians eleven thirteen, Paul calls them deceitful workmen. It was this Jesus plus works 
type of heresy. They were placing their confidence in what they did. So Paul then goes on to clarify in verse 3, we as Christians are the covenant. We worship by the power of the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus has done. It has nothing to do with anything we have done. And then Paul gives an example, one that is a little more relevant to them and to us, and speaks to how it speaks to how easy it is to have confidence in the flesh. We pick it up in verse 4. Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. This is where the passage might get pretty familiar. What follows is the well-known part where Paul kind of lists out his accolades and his accomplishments. And so I'd like to make it a little more relevant for us today by contextually, uh, contextualizing the, the translation a little bit. Starting in verse 5, what if we were to put ourselves in Paul's place? It might go something like this. I have reason to put confidence in the flesh. I was baptized as a baby in the church. I grew up in a solid Christian home. I'm in a wonderful Christian community. I'm of the people of Holland. From the original family line of the Ten Dolman Dinks. You gotta, you gotta go back pretty far to find that one. A Dutchman of Dutchmen. As to the law, a true American patriot. As to zeal, I've been to church nearly every Sunday for the last 30 years. And as to righteousness, I don't drink or play cards. I would never mow my lawn on a Sunday. How's that for having some confidence? Now, I don't mean to be uh, uh, offensive or disrespectful, but my point, and I think the point that Paul is making, is it's pretty easy to be tempted because of the things that we have to be confident in, things that have been blessings to us. It's easy to put our confidence in those things. It's easy to get caught up in the trap of thinking too much of our own righteousness. So what does Paul say about putting confidence in this kind of righteousness? We're up to verse 7. Take a look. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Whatever was to my profit, he says. My heritage, my nationality, My family name, my upbringing, my education, my career, my conduct. I consider everything a loss. I place no confidence in these pieces of garbage. Really translated pieces of poo, but we don't need to get into that. when you compare them to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. And it continues in verse 9. And, to be, and being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Here's the point. The righteousness we have is not a right for us to earn. The righteousness we have is not a right for us to earn, which is very counterintuitive to what we're used to. If you want respect, you have to earn it. If you want money, you have to earn it. If you want a diploma, you have to earn it. If you want a better job, you have to earn it. Unfortunately, in our culture, in many cases, if you want to be loved, you have to earn it. 
So it seems to reason that if we want to be in good standing with God, then we have to earn it. Easy temptation. But the answer is no. The righteousness we have is not a right for us to earn. If we're talking God's economy, what makes us right before him has nothing to do with where we're from, what we've done, who we are, or how we live. Our righteousness, what makes us right before God, is different than what makes us right in the, in the sight of others. Paul is saying here, our righteousness is found in the truth that we are sinners, saved by grace, which only comes by faith in Jesus. Nothing can add to that. And because of that, it's deserving of our full confidence. We've got the answer. We could be doing whatever we want with this life that God has given us. But because of this truth, and the confidence we can have in being made right before God because of faith in Christ, it changes the game. This is eternal. It's all powerful. It's deserving of everything we have to offer. It's what brings us together. It's what empowers us to work out our salvation. It's what we are to be encouraging each other in. Church, don't think it's because of you or anything you've done. It's because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and placing our confidence and faith in him alone. Is it right if we use a little golf analogy this morning? Sake of the season? It's like a nice new golf club sometimes, right? You get a nice new golf club? Boy, it just seems like that ball goes 15 yards further. It just feels right Boy, I think, I, I think there's even a little spin on the ball. I don't know how that happens. We start putting confidence in the club. And I know this is going to be really silly. But I think Paul's kind of making this point. If the club were on its own, can it hit the ball? The club left to itself. Can it hit the ball? No. Now let's put ourselves in the place of the club. God has designed you, and he tweaks you, and he tests you, but in the end, we're the club. When Kevin Na wins the Greenbrier Classic, we don't give credit to his clubs, right? We're the clubs. Something God can use to make an impact. Just like God uses other things to impact our lives, like family, like our upbringing, like a wonderful Christian community, like a church family. But those things don't deserve the credit. They're just clubs. We don't place our faith in them, no matter how powerful the influence they are in our lives. It's God at work through them that we can place our confidence in. So what does this look like? To take these parts of who we are and to count them as loss. And I don't know about you, but when, you're looking for, when I'm looking for answers to tough questions, it's when I go to those spiritual giants in my life. And Prof. Hendricks would get approached all the time. How do you deal with this? What would you do with that? How should I respond in this situation? What's the answer? Because they seem to have it. And we hang on any kind of response we can get for them. Well, we have that kind of a response from Paul today. We have his answer after he set up this problem that of placing too much faith and confidence or too much confidence in the flesh. We get his answer and it's in verse 10. Let's read that. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ. 
What does that mean? Paul obviously already knew Christ as a Savior. In essence, Paul is saying he wants to know by experience. He desires to experience Jesus intimately as his Lord, not just as his Savior. To know him in such a way that it would transform him inwardly as a result of that experience. That's what it, says, that's what it means when it's becoming like him. If you want to grow in confidence, like Paul, like Prof, like your spiritual giant, then follow their example and grow in your experience of Jesus. If you want to grow in confidence, grow in your experience of Jesus. Because this is life. This is a life. For a fun play on words, it's totally righteous. It's totally righteous when we put our confidence not in ourselves, but in Christ alone. He's the solid rock on which we stand. You know what God's people said? Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, only you can convict us of how we are each to live this out. It is easy for us to be tempted and take things that we have been blessed with and give those blessings the credit. But it's you, Lord, who have earned our righteousness for us. And for that, Jesus, we are so thankful. Help us. Help us to grow in our experience with you. Show each of us what it looks like and build up our confidence that we might show you to be great and wonderful and good. Amen. As the deacons come forward to collect our tithes and offerings this morning, we have Kay DePoctor who will be singing our offering. Thank you. Good morning. First, I want to share... Uh, what God put on my heart this morning. <clears throat> you just never know what he's going to do. So in my Jesus Calling book, it says, Do not worry about tomorrow. This is not a suggestion, but a command. I divided time into days and nights so that you would have manageable portions of life to handle. My grace is sufficient for you, but its sufficiency is only one day at a time. When you worry about the future, you heap day upon day of troubles into your flimsy frame. You stagger under this heavy load, which I have never intended you to carry. Throw off this oppressive burden with one quick thrust of trust. Anxious thoughts meander about and crisscross in your brain, but trusting me brings you directly into my presence. As you thus affirm your faith, shackles of worry fall off in instantly. Enjoy my presence continually by trusting me at all times. Hoping this prayer will turn out right. See, there is a boy that needs your help. I've done all that I can do myself. His mother is sure you can understand each night as he sleeps she goes in to hold his hand and she tries not to cry 
praise you, God, for these gifts, the many gifts that you give us. 
We're grateful for the way that you use them in our lives where we give you the credit. We give you the glory, Lord, and you the honor. God, use them to do great and amazing things in and through us that we would point even more so to you that you would increase, that we would decrease. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Think of how I want to parent and raise my kids and the, the solid relationship that I want to have with them and, the, and how that motivates me to, to provide for them and the same good upbringing that I was provided. But I don't want my kids to think that it is of my credit. I don't want them to point to me and say, this is all because of my dad. I want to point to Christ, that they would see him working in and through me. And that's my encouragement to us as we go, as we acknowledge the blessings in our lives, that we would point to Christ and all he has done, that he would be made great. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.